right. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's great that you're all here and you're all very excited. That's awesome. Uh, okay, so there's a couple uh, minor announcements. Uh, so the first, lots of people asked about homework four. Thank you for doing that. That's awesome that you're so eager to do it. Uh, it's now posted today. So it's posted with, uh, with week nine's materials. Uh, if you're a real dork, and I love real dorks, uh, the LaTeX code is also available. So if you wanna, if you wanna steal the LaTeX code, it's there. Uh, so it's not too long. Um, I figure it should be doable in about like two or three hours. Um, so there it is, it's available online now. Okay, and it's due next week in tutorial. So not this week, but next week. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, there's recommended exercises. Just today I put up some questions from the past finals. So if you want to uh, tackle, tackle those, we're going to be looking at one of them today in a lecture. Okay. Uh, oh, right. Uh, there's two minor announcements. Uh, the first is if you, want, if you submitted for a remark, uh, So I'm happy to say that your mark either stayed the same or went up. Sometimes people ask for a remark and then their mark goes down. It's very sad. Uh, so if you ask for a remark, uh, they're going to be available. Uh, this coming Friday, Friday, July 13th in I see 200 from, what's the times there? Uh, the times are four till six. Okay, so if you want to pick up your remark test, uh, you have to pick it up this Friday between four and six. Uh, otherwise, you have to come to office hours and get it. Okay, so book extra office hours. Usually when people pick up these remarks, I like to say a little bit about why the remark choice was made the way it was. So I recommend coming uh, during those times, okay? Any questions or thoughts there? Okay, so if you're not on campus this Friday, please uh, come to office hours and pick them up from office hours. Okay. Uh, another announcement. Just to make sure that it gets in everyone's calendar is we have our mock final uh, two weeks this Friday. Okay, so two weeks this Friday. That's going to be in SY110 at 12 till 3. Okay, uh, also please, if you, if you want to come out, please try and stay for the whole thing. It gives me a, a very accurate sense of how long the, the timing is. I think the midterm was a little bit long, uh, so I want to make sure the final, you know, there's enough time to do it. Okay, so Remark and mock final. Okay, questions or thoughts there? Yes. Yes. Sure. Yep. 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 It'll be posted on the the website. Yep. Yep. Um, great. Yeah. Friday's the Friday's the only day that I don't teach, so I I book extra things on Friday, but I know it conflicts with other people's stuff. So. Uh, okay. So what do we have to today? Today we're going to look at a first look at this idea of constrained optimization. Okay, so, so far 
the examples that we've been doing have been optimize something on its domain. So, so far all the critical points and mins and maxes and stuff has been has been just find the biggest value of the thing uh, on its domain, right? But there's, there's interesting phenomena that come up when we uh, restrict the domain. So a whole new sort of thing happens when we restrict the domain to, um, to something smaller. So let's see an example of that in the one variable context. Okay, so let's see where the domain really matters in the one variable context. So we want to maximize this guy between 1 and 2. So let's see what happens here. We'll start off just the, the way we did just before, finding the critical points. Okay, so we take our first derivative. Set that guy equal to zero. There's only one way that can happen, which is when x is 0. OK. Now, observe that that's outside of our domain, right? That's outside of this range. Okay, so that critical point isn't going to matter. So what do we do now? What's the step from first year calculus? Yep. Yeah, we have to check the endpoints because if it's not at a critical point, it could be at a boundary or an endpoint. So we'll check the endpoints by evaluating there. And then we see that our max is at that point uh, 4. Okay, so what do we got? Our curve looks something like this. Right, between 1 and 2. We can see that we're increasing, and our largest value is at f of 2. OK, so that's uh, uh, what happens in one dimension. Now let's see sort of a similar phenomena happen one dimension up.
Okay, so one dimension up, we want to maximize this guy on the triangle with these vertices. So now we've got a shape to deal with. Okay, so there are three vertices, and now we want to maximize x squared plus y squared on this, on this fellow here. Uh, okay, so what do we do? We do the critical points check, uh, second derivative check, all that. Okay, if we're a critical point, these derivatives zero out, and we get this, which as we've seen before, that guy's going to be a minimum. So we'll apply the second derivative test. So that'll be a minimum. Okay, so now we want to find out which point in that triangle will give us the max. Oh yes, for people who came in towards the end, if you, if you submitted for a remark, um, please pick it up uh, Friday, July 13th, IC 200. Uh, okay, very good. So now the question arises, how do we find the max? Uh, because our second derivative test didn't tell us much, right? So we're kind of in this situation where we have to check the endpoints of this thing. The endpoints of this triangle are going to be the boundaries of the triangle. It's going to be the, the border of the triangle. Okay, so the border is kind of like the endpoints of the region. Okay, and the way I propose to do that is to think very carefully about how uh, the level sets would interact with this triangle. Okay, so we're going to kind of do a contour plot type thing. So here's where we start uh, at x squared plus y squared is equal to zero. Then we go a little bit bigger. Okay, and note that here uh, the, the level sets are, are increasing. Okay, so they get a little bit bigger yet. Oh no, it's not. Oh, that's fine. Okay, 
Okay, so that's the last level set that meets the, the region. Any other level set out here will no longer touch the, the, the triangle that we care about. Okay, so what do we do? We look for still touches the boundary, right? So we want to find the, this level set here, this last one that forms a full circle. So we note that it passes through these last two vertices. Okay, so we get Uh, that these guys are equal and they both equal to four. Okay, so the last level set that touches our region is this guy corresponding to four. Okay, very good. So let's um, have a look at some more examples of this kind of thing. Oh, wait. Uh, yeah, sorry, we need to introduce sort of one of the key tools in this, um, this kind of thinking. Okay, so can anyone recall the definition of being an open set? people recall the definition of open? It was many moons ago. Right, so we say that something is open if for all x in the set There is epsilon such that this disk of radius epsilon is contained in our set S. Okay, so the idea is that any point in the set can be surrounded by a disk. Okay, so something's open if any point in it has a, a small neighborhood around it. Okay. 
So now we're going to introduce a couple more terms uh, from topology. Oops. Okay, we say that something is closed if if everything in Rn other than T is open. Okay, sort of a confusing notion. It's not exactly the opposite of being open, but it is that your everything other than you is open. Okay, so what this is saying is Every point outside of T can be surrounded by a disk. Okay, so we can wrap any point outside in a disk. Um, Okay, so just to get a sense of what an open set would look like, or sorry, to what a closed set would look like, if we've got, say, the interval 1, 2, then everything outside of 1, 2, any guy that lives over here, can be surrounded by a disk or any guy that lives over here can be surrounded by a disk. Okay, so closed means that your complement is open. Um, okay, open, closed, good. Okay, now we need another term. We say this set is bounded if um, if it lives in some large disk. Okay, a set is bounded if there's a number such that u lives inside the disk of that radius. Okay, so So the whole set U itself can be surrounded by one disk, okay? A very large radius sometimes. Okay, so that's a lot of new definitions. I now want to state sort of one of the, the, sort of the key theorems in this class. It's one of these things I wish that we could prove, but it would take us a whole other course. So we won't prove it. Or maybe you take us a whole other lecture. I'm not sure. Uh, okay, so this is the, called the extreme value theorem. And it says...
if S is closed and bounded, then any continuous function on S then any continuous function achieves a maximum and a minimum. Okay, so we can think of this as like f of x is big M, let's say x0 is big M, and f of x1 is little m. Okay, so if you're closed and bounded, any continuous function on you has a max and a min. Okay, so I want to take some time to try and make the hypotheses of this theorem clearer. Why we, why we care about closed and bounded. Thank you. Okay. All right, why do we need these, these two hypotheses? Um, they're both important and if we drop them, the theorem suddenly becomes false. So I want to do some examples that, that indicate why we need these hypotheses. So I want to organize them into sort of like a chart. Okay, so let's have um, bounded up here. Closed down here. Okay, so if you're in if you're in this row, that means you're closed, and if you're in this row, it means you're not closed. Um, okay, so in this row, or sorry, in, in this square, uh, we have both hypotheses. So the theorem's true there. This is where we want to be in math. Uh, so now let's think about something that's closed but not bounded. Okay, so the kind of interval that we might be thinking of here is something like zero to infinity, right? So it's closed because any point not in this thing we can surround with a little disk. Right? Any point not in here would be like the negative numbers. And we can separate them from this with a small disk. Okay, so uh, what would be a function that um, doesn't have a minimum? 
uh, but is continuous there. Okay, let's say something like this guy here, right? What happens if we're, if we're this function? We start off at one and then we keep decreasing down. We just get smaller and smaller. So we have no minimum. Okay, so we have a max but no min. Uh, here we want something that's bounded but not closed. Can you think of something that's bounded but not closed? Okay. Yeah, sure, an open set. Okay. Uh, let's pick this guy here, right? It's not closed because there are guys outside it that can't be surrounded with a disk, right? So zero is not in here but any disk around zero will hit this set. Okay. And if we take this function, just the identity, we have no max and no min. Right, when we look at the identity on this function, we can go to like 0.9, we can go to 0 0.99, but we never actually have a maximum on that set. We get larger and larger, but no maximum. Okay, and here, not bounded, not closed. Here we could put all sorts of crazy things. Uh, let's put... zero to infinity. Here again, we, we lack a max enemy. Okay, so we need, we need these hypotheses because if we lack either of them, um, everything blows up. In a very tame mathematical way. Uh, okay, sweet. So this extreme value theorem guarantees us that there are lots of maxes and mins as long as we have suitable hypotheses on our set. Uh, okay, so I'd like to finish off with an example from one of the past finals. That'll sort of get us headed in the direction of next lecture. Okay, so it's from there, find. So find the maximum of x squared minus 3x plus y squared minus 2y plus z squared minus 4z plus 11 on the ball that's shaped like this. I think that's right.
uh, sorry, plus, plus one at the end. Um, okay, excellent. So take that down, think about that for a moment. Okay, so uh, the extreme value theorem says this guy is bounded, this guy is closed, therefore this guy has to have a max somewhere, right? It's bounded because it's, um, you know, a fixed radius ball, and it's closed because we include the boundary when that's equal to nine. Okay, so let's give this a shot. So we'll find our critical points. Right, so we get that these guys all have to zero out. So solving the equations, we get this. And this point is somewhere in our ball, right? Uh, these guys square to something less than 9. So this point is in our ball. Now let's do uh, our second derivative test. Right, we take our second derivative and we get this. which tells us that our critical point is actually going to be a minimum. Okay, but we're, we're headed in search of a maximum, right? So we want to maximize this function on the ball, not minimize it. So we have to um, we have to use other methods.
Okay, so now our problem is this. Uh, the maximum is going to occur somewhere on the boundary, right? And we need to find where that point is. But the boundary is this sphere. It's got tons and tons of stuff in it. So it's not quite clear how to proceed. So I want to do one way of proceeding today, and then we'll build that into a technique or a theory uh, next, next lecture. Okay, so our first observation is that we've got the following form. It's plus three, minus three. minus 2y okay so our first observation is that we've got the equation of a sphere sort of inside us right so we're going to use our constraint We'll make use of that equation. To rewrite our function like this. Okay, and now I've been, <laughs> I've left the projector on the whole time just to do this one graphic demo here. Uh, so I want to say what the, um, this sort of level sets picture looks like in this context. Wake up computer. Wait, what? Okay, it doesn't want to do the thing. Oh no, it really fell asleep. get the graphing thing all right so what do we have we have a sphere like this Good, we don't need to draw the thing. <laughs> Aha, beautiful. Okay, so we've got a sphere. Okay, and now we're trying to find where this function is maximized on our sphere. So what we do 
is we do this same approach with level curves. So our function, uh, we can rewrite it as 10 minus 3x minus 2y. And now we'll look for level curves of that thing. So we say 10 minus 3x minus 2y minus 4z is equal to, say, 5. Right? There's one level curve of the function we're trying to optimize. And we see that it cuts through the middle of the sphere here. Right? So it's cutting the sphere along some plane. And we want to find the maximum value of this function. So we're going to, let's see, what happens if we make this into a 6? Maybe 8. Ah, OK, so when we, when we increase the value of the level set, these things are going sort of downwards. Right? So they're moving, the planes are moving uh, down into the bottom left. So we can go 16, 18, 20. Right? And this, the level curve we're looking for is that one that becomes tangent to the sphere. We eventually want to get that the, the blue plane is touching it at exactly one point, right? So if we keep moving out, can maybe move to 24, 20, oh, okay, 28 was too much. Okay, so there's where it's just cutting off a very small part. So what do we do? We've got all these planes with the same normal. Oh, here the colors are reversed. So all of these planes have the same normal, which is negative 3, negative 2, 4. So what we want to do is we want to find where does the line spanned by that normal meet the sphere. It'll meet it at two spots, one in the positive hemisphere, one in the negative hemisphere. And that will be where we get that last point of tangency uh, right here. OK, so I leave you with the following. Okay, find where the line meets the, the sphere, and then you'll get um, this point of tan. You'll get two points, one in the positive hemisphere up here, and one in the negative hemisphere, and that'll be where the maximum occurs. Okay, so we're going to develop this into uh, an approach to optimization next lecture uh, on Thursday morning. Okay, thanks folks.